Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us on our webinar on healthcare financing partnerships, partnerships, financing for partnerships between health and housing and community development. Um, welcome again, and everybody should be zooming by now. Uh, this is the second part of our webinar. The first part of our webinar featured Lynn Cooper from the Consumers Union, and she did an in-depth exploration of what's changing for healthcare in the financing system and what's promoting and supporting the potential for partnerships. Um, and we are going to get underway right now. Um, just a couple of logistics, which is always the most exciting part of this. If you have questions, you can use the Zoom Q&A function or you can email health at nw.org. The webinar will be recorded and we'll send it out afterwards. And if you have any qu technical questions at all, just contact health at nw.org and um, we'll start right now. So thank you for joining us here at NeighborWorks America. Um, I know many of you are familiar with NeighborWorks America, but we are a congressionally chartered nonprofit that does affordable housing and community development in all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. Um, and you can see some amazing facts on your screen, uh, about 154,000 rent homes owned and managed, 21,000 new homeowners. Um, and I think one of the exciting things is that our organizations are increasingly uh, recognizing that the influence of community development and affordable housing on health. Um, and we were started here at uh, NeighborWorks America to focus about three years ago about the connection between health, housing, and community development. Um, and we have since then set up two demonstration projects, uh, one with 28 sites across the U.S. who are thinking about how to more intentionally connect health, housing, and community development. And we have a second in partnership with Enterprise Community Partners um, that has 20 organizations who are measuring health outcomes associated with housing and community development. Um, and that's just a few of the different things that are going on in this space. Uh, this webinar is part of our efforts to really support the increasing connection between health, housing, and community development. And it is my distinct pleasure um, to welcome you to this webinar. My name is Sarah Norman. I'm Deck Director of Healthy of Homes and Communities here at NeighborWorks America. And I'm here today with my colleague, Hugh Truong, who is our Senior Manager of Healthy Homes and Communities. And I am going to have a action-packed webinar for you today. First, we'll have Colby Daly from the Build Healthy Places Network. And she's gonna talk about partnerships between health and community development from a very, very, very intentionally place-based perspective, um, generally serving folks across the lifespan and, and but cognizant of critical moments in the lifespan. Uh, but again, these are very part, very place-based strategies. After that, Alicia is up, Alicia Sanders, director of um, at Leading Age, and she's going to focus on partnerships supporting senior residents, a special focus on that, connecting health and housing. Um, and finally, um, a little sort of uh, addition to the webinar, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about supportive housing at our last a webinar about financing and healthcare financing. Lynn Cooper brought up supportive housing as, as sort of a hot area that's making the connection between health, housing, community development. And feedback we got was, can we dig deeper into supportive housing? So I'm pinch hitting on that. Um, and we'll be referencing a lot of really amazing work that's going on nationally and locally. Um, so with that, no much further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Colby Daly, um, who's, who's managing director at Build Healthy Places to talk about place-based strategies, who's partnering, and how. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, we can. You're coming through great. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for having me on today. It's really a pleasure to be here. And as Sarah said, my name is Colby Daly. I'm the Managing Director of the Build Healthy Places Network. We're a national network based in San Francisco with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to intentionally connect community development and health sectors. Um, the idea being that the roots of poor health and poverty are the same. And by joining forces, these sectors can have um, increasing impact in the work that they're doing. So next slide, please. Sarah asked me, the NeighborWorks uh, folks asked me to provide some examples of how healthcare is making investments housing in with a place-based strategy and so that's what I'll do today um, here are the examples that I will be covering Cincinnati Children's na uh, Nationwide Children's in Columbus Ohio Trinity Health which is a, a national health system and United Healthcare which is an actual um, as you 
I'm sure know as an insurer. And I'll talk you through some resources that we have for more information um, for your reference. Um, next slide, please. And you'll have to forgive me, I'm battling a cold, so um, I'll try not to, to let that come through on the, on the presentation. But uh, before I get into the examples, sort of an overarching um, context that I wanted to provide was that, you know, we are seeing increasing motivation and momentum from healthcare to invest in, in neighborhoods and place-based strategies. And I think the, you know, increasing recognition that keeping people healthy uh, happens, um, health, health happens outside of hospitals is, um, is growing and there's a growing understanding of that. But in addition, you know, ca sort of catalyzed by the ACA and the movement from value to, uh, from volume to value is another sort of push for the, for the sectors. And um, I think it's safe to say that irrespective of what happens today or in the future with healthcare policy, there is an, a momentum and enthusiasm among healthcare um, practitioners and leaders to continue this work in um, in helping to make neighborhoods and, and folks healthier. Where we're seeing um, the leadership and where we're seeing sort of the pioneer efforts um, moving forward, not surprisingly, it's coming out of um, sort of those who are more predisposed toward um, or have an orientation toward mission. Um, often that's the children's hospitals. Uh, who are serving um, underserved children um, and children globally around their, where they're regionally based. Um, and then also the, the Catholic and, and faith-based health systems who also have a mission orientation. But we're also seeing it from those who have more of a business case. Um, Kaiser, for example, who provides uh, both health care to patients, but also insures those patients, has a real incentive to keep people healthy. Um, and also, of course, other insurers like United Healthcare, which I'll talk about more in a moment. So uh, go ahead to the next slide, please. First, I, I wanted to talk about Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Nationwide um, really sees sort of the revitalization of neighborhoods around the hospital as a priority. And they have um, really begun to do some amazing things in terms of investing in housing. Uh, they have a partnership with a, a local community development corporation and a pro project called Healthy Homes. Which, uh, through which it's contributed 8 million of a total of 18 million in public private money to improve housing in the contiguous neighborhoods over six years. Um, over the past six years, Nationwide has built and sold 11 homes, actual new builds on vacant lots, rehabbed and sold 47 abandoned homes and provided uh, 65 home improvement grants. It's also funded, the hospital has funded 58 new townhomes and apartments. And actually recently it launched a rental company, which is rehabbing 15 rental units and it plans to create 75 more rental units over the next four years um, and a housing project with 50 dwellings through financing that's still coming together but led by the hospital. And the, I think the real point here in addition to just how sort of profound these investments are and how they're being made um, is that the hospital also recognizes that you know it's been buying property in this area for a long time it has a lot of real estate expertise and it knows how to do things like getting permits for street improvements it has relationships with city hall and so the dollars that it's investing combined with the political and marketing capital that it has and the power uh, within the community really makes this hospital um, a resource and an asset and it's building capacity within the community to um, to really uh, develop. So um, this is a great example in a community that has um, sort of suffered through deindustrialization and um, and subsequent sort of collapse of the, the markets around it. So next slide please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another really good example of this is Cincinnati Children's Hospital, um, specifically some of the work that they're doing in the Avondale neighborhood, which is one of the most distressed, um, if not the most distressed neighborhood in the, in the area. Um, Cincinnati Children has recognized this um, and has been working really intentionally with local community development partners to sort of engage the community and build up capacity 
Uh, they are investing, the hospital is investing 11 million over five years. Um, 10 million of it is specifically for improving housing conditions and promoting redevelopment with another million or so for workforce development. And so it really gets this. Um, interestingly as well, it is um, Cincinnati Children's has through its community partnerships, a really close partnership within um, Cincinnati LISC, Local Initiative Support Corporation, which is part of the national LISC um, CDFI network. And um, they're, they're doing incredible work together. So another example of a hospital really partnering with community development to make uh, neighborhood revitalization happen in a neighborhood. Next slide. <clears throat> the third example for um, I wanted to talk about was Trinity Health and Trinity Health as I mentioned is a national health system it has it operates in 22 states um, with a, a number of uh, what they call regional health ministries or, or their hospitals. Um, what's interesting about what Trinity has done, and, and this is not, I, I think Trinity is a leader in this. There are other health systems. Dignity Health is another huge leader um, in, in work investing locally and investing um, through using community development finance institutions. But just to speak to Trinity for a minute, they have a strategy where they're allocating 1% of their operating uh, portfolio which seeks a return. These are uh, loans that they provide up to five years, um, usually around three years. And um, Trinity has invested 25 million with CDFIs so far. Um, they have a new initiative out that you may have heard of called the Transforming Communities Initiative. It's an $80 million initiative over the next five years. 40 million of that is um, designated to be deployed with CDFIs. Uh, but to say more specifically about kinds of investments that they're making in housing. Um, at Trinity has historically supported a list or a number of projects. Uh, for example, it's partnered with the Finance Fund in Ohio to renovate and expand um, a child care center. So that's um, in addition to housing in Noble County, Ohio. It's partnered with the Nonprofit Finance Fund, which is a national CDFI headquartered in New York, to provide a um, mortgage loan and finance the construction of um, a 51-bed family shelter in Macomb County, Michigan. Uh, the, it partnered with a, the Leviticus Fund, a CDFI that funds in the Northeast, to provide a construction loan for affordable home ownership projects for low-income families in Newark. And um, it's also partnered with the Corporation for Supportive Housing to provide um, financing for a new building that will have 40 units of permanent supportive housing for homeless and at-risk parenting youth in Chicago. So those are just a few examples of how Trinity is investing and um, as I said, there are others like Dignity Health, um, which is important to mention, um, doing this kind of work and partnering with CDFIs for local uh, place-based change. Next slide, please. The last example I wanted to mention was United Healthcare. Um, this is a relatively new um, project that actually I think it was just last year that sort of the news release came out on it. But United Healthcare, working with Chicano Por La Casa, which is the largest CDC community development corporation in Phoenix or in Arizona, it's um, based in Phoenix, and um, partnering with United Healthcare. Um, United Healthcare actually provided a $22 million direct capital investment so that CPLC could acquire, develop, and operate a multifamily multi housing uh, project in the Phoenix area. And it offers um, that money can also be used for operating and um, providing a, a number of services. And so this is really unique because it's an example of a um, of a, an insurer investing. Um, investing from its reserves. It's a direct capital investment and um, they saw this as, as good business and also a way to sort of get some of some of their their highest utilizers. So those folks who are unstably housed, they were seeing in the emergency rooms over and over again. Um, United Healthcare saw that there was a benefit to um, certainly for the community and for the patients, but also 
for their own business to have these people stably housed. And so that was the goal with this investment. And um, from what I understand, they're looking to replicate it. So it's a significant one, 22 million um, with the CDC and pretty exciting. So we're always lifting it up as an example as with these others, as I mentioned, which are certainly cutting edge. Next slide, please. Um, oh, and I did want to mention that um, Chicanos por la Casa is also um, it was an innovation awardee from Health, Healthy Homes and Communities at NeighborWorks. So it's a NeighborWorks organization that has won the innovation award, which is um, very appropriate given the given this webinar. Um, just to take you through a few of our resources, if you want to dig into them deep, more deeply, um, we are, our vision are, is communities where all people can live healthy and rewarding lives. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. You can find us online and Twitter, of course. But I want to point out we also have a magazine series called Crosswalk, uh, which is available on Medium. And we have a, a recent essay that we published um, that really talks about the Ohio Children's Hospitals that I mentioned nationwide and, and Cincinnati and uh, gives some more context for the work that they're doing. Next slide, please. And a few other resources, I just encourage you to um, sign up for our newsletter or get involved through the blog series. And um, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to reach out. But again, we, our work is to really connect community development and health sectors, lift up examples of what works, and really build the knowledge base for cross-sector collaboration. So if you know of examples, then um, absolutely send them our way. We want to know about them and dig into them and lift them up as well. And uh, next slide. And the last resource that I wanted to point out is, as we are a bridge for cross-sector collaboration, we recognize that there are language barriers for the sectors to work together. And so we are, our, our hope is that we can provide tools for the sectors to navigate those, those challenges. Um, we have a jargon buster available on our website that does just that. And so you can um, take a look at what CDC means for the community development world and what CDC means for the health world. And you can understand that we have, you know, some, some of those challenges in front of us. But um, this attempts to get at some of those. So have a look. And with that, um, I guess I can either take questions or turn it back over to you, Sarah, to go further. Great. Yes, this is now the time for folks to ask questions of Colby. And if you're still getting used to Zoom, there is a Q&A function that you can use for questions. And I'll um, maybe while we're waiting a second for folks to enter in questions, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll contribute my own or I'll contribute my own comment, which is that uh, I read in the New York Times recently that United Health has invested $350 million in 56 affordable housing um, projects in 14 states since 2011. Um, so that's, you know, just to build on the work that was going on with Chicanos por la Causa and uh, with United, there's, there's many other examples. Um, and in fact, in the NeighborWorks Network, um, Foundation Communities was partnering with them um, on a low-income housing tax credit project uh, that's been since been developed called Capital Studios. Uh, and a second example, I believe, involved Common Bond that was also a low-income housing tax credit project. And now there is a question. Sarah, so, for me, uh, I just to build on your, your comment, um, so that what's really interesting about Chicano por la Casa is that the $350 million that you mentioned is, I think, for the most part, or if not all, um, LIHTC deals, low-income housing tax credit deals, um, and this $22 million to, to CPLC is actually a direct investment with no tax credit, so they saw tremendous value in making that, um, doing that deal themselves, um, which I think is particularly interesting um, for an insurer. So just to note the difference there, it's, it's an interesting um, innovation. Yeah, it is, it is very interesting. And, and, and um, I could, we could dig deeper on it, but we actually all of a sudden have a million questions. So I'll, um, I'll step back and forth with you, Colby, and try to answer, uh, not answer, I will try to ask the questions for you. Um, so the first question is an excellent question from a very big picture perspective. Colby, do you think that the partnerships were primarily instigated by the Affordable Care Act requirements or were there other factors at play that jumped started them? 
Sure. Well, in the case of the, the hospitals, um, those efforts started years ago before the ACA um, had come in, uh, had been enacted. As you know, the ACA sort of came online um, in the last two to th two to three years. Um, so these efforts are really a response to what they were saying in the neighborhood. In the case of nation nationwide, they recognized that historically they hadn't been a terribly good neighbor and sometimes um, with eminent domain and other efforts really push the neighbors out the community out and so a little of, uh, of the work that they're doing now is a response to that and sort of um, building uh, the community that they really do feel part of and and so these are long-standing efforts um, I would say that the ACA has uh, really catalyzed an enthusiasm and, and catalyzed this trend um, but as I, I mentioned, I, I think that irrespective of where the ACA ends up, uh, this, this uh, momentum, we're cautiously optimistic, will continue. <clears throat> sure. I'm going to, I'm going to, we have more questions than I have a feeling we're going to be able to answer, which is good. Um, and I'm going to just kind of play a little bit with them. Um, somebody asked, do you have any suggestions for working with for-profit hospitals in a rural area and the and that's connected to questions around the difference between rural, I mean not rural, between nonprofit and for-profit. And in our last webinar, we spent a little bit of time talking about the community benefit requirements. So I'm going to let Colby answer the question, but I'm also going to suggest that folks might want to take a look at that webinar because it has a really nice overview of community benefit requirements. And we did a webinar about a year ago that actually had Julie Trocchio from the Catholic Health Association, which has been a major leader on community benefits. And she did a beautiful overview. And those two will come out in um, your resource package. Um, but I'm going to unpack these two questions and give Colby a chance to answer. Question one is really, I think I'd like to ask this question about rural versus urban in terms of partnering with hospitals and any trends you've seen there. And then the second question about differences in requirements for for-profit and not-for-profit hospitals. Sure. Well, let me take the second part of that first. And just to say that I actually, I, I am certainly not an expert in, in private hospitals or nonprofit hospitals for that matter. I do know that private hospitals are not beholden to the, the um, community benefit regulations because those are driven by the IRS as part of the tax exempt status um, that uh, nonprofit hospitals have. So, you know, that, that is going to be very different and the incentives are going to be different. I guess what I would say is that where there is, um, I think, opportunity is through um, how healthcare is paid for, whether it's through uh, Medicaid or Medicare or other insurance, um, sort of that, that case to be made that healthier patients is good for the payers. And um, you know, certainly in your states, there may be uh, Medicaid waivers or other sort of activities around Medicaid that could be helpful in that way, um, sort of that, that don't rely on the, the kind of health care provider um, tax status. So I'm afraid that's kind of the, the depth of expertise I have in that area. Um, rural and urban is an excellent question. I think it's one that we're um, tackling uh, or we hear all the time. Um, I think one thing that we're definitely, um, it is really hard for a hospital that's not in the community where there isn't a healthcare center or a hospital in the community um, to, to really um, see, make that link to the place-based efforts um, that might be in a rural community 30 miles away. Um, so those are connections that I think are important and that we're trying to get our head around how we can, as a network, be useful in connecting um, resources. But um, I don't have a good example of a rural hospital and I would love to have one. So investing in place-based initiatives. So if you have one, please do send those my way as well. Yeah, and I'm going to have to think for a second about an example of a rural hospital. Um, yeah. But I'm, I won't take up folks' time. I'm going to move on to another question, which is, can Colby summarize the leverage points that are common for hospitals? Mm -hmm. And the person who's asking this question said, I heard it's good, good business. There's a return on investment. Um, housing patients who are high users of healthcare. care. Um, what else? That's the question you just got. Sure. 
I think there are three categories here, um, and it depends on who you're talking to at the hospital, right? There's a mission case to be made uh, for making people healthier outside of hospital walls. There's a sort of a regulatory case to be made for meeting community, bene community benefit and ACA requirements um, or, or IRS requirements, and there is a business case to be made. And I think that if you're talking to the um, C-suite, the CEO or the CFO, it's that business case that needs to be made. Um, and and that, is a, that, is, that is a tricky one because it's gonna vary per audience, it's gonna vary per community. But um, I think that those are the three main leverage points there. And what we've heard from hospitals is that um, they need more examples of other hospitals doing this work. And that's really a big part of the motivation and momentum that um, can get this work off the ground. And so that's, I think, the major role that we can play at the network is to lift up the examples we know of so that when we get a question from a children's hospital or another saying, we don't know um, if what we're doing is enough or a lot or what is going on with other hospitals, we can say, it's, here's what others are doing and let's figure out a way to do this, uh, do more of it. Great. And, you know, and I just realized I wanted to jump in because I realized that um, my brain wasn't firing right because I can think of a beautiful example of a, rural, a hospital working in a rural environment, which is um, Rutland Regional Medical Center up in Vermont, which has really partnered very deeply with Naval Works Western Vermont. And they're working on two different efforts. One is on healthy homes rehab. Um, for folks who have either respiratory issues or other um, physical uh, uh, health issues that are associated with the quality of the housing or the sort of the accessibility of the housing. But the second thing is that they've been a supporter of efforts around opiate, um, uh, response to the opioid uh, issues in a very strong partnership with the hospitals, with their police, with um, neighborhood uh, revitalization e efforts like Neighborhoods Western Vermont, and I can't believe it didn't come to the tip of my tongue. Uh, so, and, and Colby actually helped to feature them in one of her amazing um, <laughs> news blasts. Um, what, what do you, Crosswalks Magazine, thank you. So we have a million questions, which is yeah. great. We're actually gonna compile them and try to make sure that we can try to help people uh, get resources related to them. Um, and if we do have time at the end, we can go back to them. But I really want to be respectful that Alicia Sanders, who is a uh, expert on sort of senior health and housing innovations, has also joined us. And she is going to sort of take a more population focused uh, sort of view of the health and housing partnerships. And I'm going to turn it over to Alicia. Oh, and thank you, Colby. Oh, it's my pleasure. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And and, and thank you, Colby. I'm happy to be here with you today to talk about this. Um, so I'm Alicia Sanders. I'm the Director of Housing and Services Policy Research at Leading Age. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I'll give you a little bit of overview of what Leading Age is, uh, for those of you that don't know. So Leading Age is an association of nonprofit organizations that represent um, the field of aging services. So our members kind of run the gamut of different types of services and settings. Um, and we provide three kind of three core areas of support to, the, to our members in the form of advocacy, education, and research. Um, so we have about 6,000 members, um, and about a third of our members are affordable senior housing properties. Our, our members are actually the individual properties, not the organizations. Um, and I sit in our um, and direct our Center for Housing Plus Services, where we are really focusing on studying these affordable housing plus services linkages for um, seniors, for low-income seniors, to really help inform policy and practice that will support the um, creation and implementation and, um, and really the, uh, the scalability and sustainability of these types of models. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, um, I'm gonna start out with telling you about um, an example in Portland, Oregon. Um, this is a pilot that has been operating for about two or three years, um, and they are cleverly named Housing with Services. Um, and what it is is a care navigation program that is based in 11 affordable housing properties that serve older adults and um, younger persons with disabilities. 
Um, and there's three housing organizations um, represented in this initiative. And one of them is um, one of your neighbor worked colleagues, colleagues reach CDC. And it, it, the pictures that are in these slides are um, pictures of their three properties that are participating in the initiative. So um, the Housing Services Program um, really has three components. Um, the first one is a multidisciplinary care navigation team that works on site across all 11 housing properties. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that team in a few slides. And that team partners with the resident service coordinators that work in each of those 11 buildings. And then connected, they have a, a, a a big range of partner agencies that provide either targeted services to the properties or they've agreed to formal communication and coordination channels with the uh, navigation team. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, and um, again, that's another REACH CDC property that's um, participating in the pilot. Um, and so I want to highlight there's really two key features of this model that I want to highlight for you um, that are addressing two key problems to these and challenges to making these housing and services partnerships, um, housing and health services partnerships. Um, so the two key features of the model is that it's the service delivery mechanism that delivers services, care navigation services across a network of affordable housing communities. So they've brought these 11 housing properties together that have about um, over over a thousand residents across them. And then um, there's a funding mechanism that pools resources from multiple stakeholders to support and deliver those services. Um, and I will give you a little more detail about that in just a few slides. But really what this is trying to address is the is the problems with and the challenges to making these these linkages for health entities is having the volume of residents in a single housing property to make the investment worthwhile. Because as I'm sure many of you know, one of the challenges is that residents in these housing properties, senior residents in these housing properties can often be, they can be a Medicare fee for service, they can go, they can be in different Medicare Advantage plans, they can use different doctors in different hospitals. So figuring out a way that you can organize and cluster a large enough group of uh, people to make the investment worthwhile um, for the healthcare entities is what is one of the um, main things that this model was trying to address. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this I wanted to just give you a visual of, of the program structure and I really want to focus on that oval in the middle, um, which shows that care navigation team. And you can see the different roles that are a part of that. And they work together as a team across the 11 housing properties where they can, they partner where and collaborate um, when appropriate with the service coordinators in each of those properties. Um, and I'm gonna, if we go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about how that navigation team is, is funded and supported. Um, so essentially, the way the services are delivered and supported is primarily through in-kind staffing from the health entities. And you can see that there's, a, there's three health plans that are involved in this and are contributing um, in-kind staff. So they are those care navigator staff that are going to the site. Um, or else there's one health plan that's, the part, that's providing a grant to support a, um, a staff position. So those, those entities decided rather than contribute money directly for the staff that they would contribute the staff directly, but really it, it could happen in either way. And then the, um, the program administration is supported by um, equity contributions from the members of the LLC. And I didn't go into a lot of details about that, but there's a group of um, multi, about nine stakeholders that came together to form this and operate this and oversee this pilot. And the, the key thing about um, these funding partners, uh, health entities collaborating together is they all agreed to be at, um, plan agnostic. So when they're in a building, they see anybody, um, they assist anyone who comes to them, regardless of whether they're the insurer for them or not. 
Um, and that may mean that ultimately they refer them or get them connected back with their plan. But when they're on site at the property, they're helping anybody that comes to them. Um, the next slide, please. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about the, the interest that these health entities had in getting involved in this um, initiative because it's, it wasn't necessarily just focused on the dollars they could save. Um, and I think we tend to focus on the, these partnerships being about the ROI. And sometimes we need to think about that, um, that return on investment a little um, more broadly. Um, so the plans all, um, all said that they were interested in testing this new way in which to deliver services. And this new way was you know, basically delivering services out into the community. So focusing on um, thinking about what Colby said earlier, that we know that not all health happens in the doctor's office. So these plans were interested in seeing if they could get out into the community and work in the community um, and engage with their members in a different way than they would have, they traditionally had just through a physician's office. Um, they also really saw that by getting into people's homes and working with the service coordinators and the, and the property staff that saw these residents every day, there was a chance to help um, identify uh, early problems before they became major crises and, and progressed up to expensive um, emergency room or hospital use. Um, and they also saw the value, um, you know, speaking to that willingness to be plan agnostic and serving residents, they saw the value of leveraging the resources that each one of them brought through the property. So they were able to see that, well, you know, I'm seeing another person, uh, another plan's members, but they're also seeing mine. And so, you know, we're kind of, and they're bringing resources, I'm bringing resources, and we're able to leverage that both for our members and for our staff to be able to support the members. Um, so next slide, please. And I just wanted to tell you about another area, an uh, initiative in another area of the country all the way across on the East Coast, where a similar type of, of initiative is in development. Um, this is a group in Massachusetts, um, in the Boston area, of stakeholders that are coming together to, to do a similar thing and address those same challenges of, of being able to have the volume of people to get the health entities interested in um, putting additional resources and collaborating into these housing properties. So this is a group of stakeholders, um, housing providers, um, senior care option plans, which um, are a, a type of plan in Massachusetts. It's really a managed care plan for dual eligibles and some PACE providers. Um, and they're in the process of figuring out exactly how they're going to implement this, um, but it is getting implemented and they're working through their structure and their details now. Um, and what they're doing is figuring out how they can fund supplemental services in affordable senior housing properties and how the health plans, um, the SCOs and the PACE program can have a tighter collaboration with the housing properties. And what they're thinking of doing right now is, Oh, uh, Lisa? Do you mind just yes. explaining for folks what dual eligibles are, what PACE is, just in case they missed that, and just in case. Thank you. Sure. Sure. So dual eligibles um, are individuals who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. And through, um, and through some data matching that we've been able to do um, in, in a study for HUD in senior housing properties, we found that roughly two-thirds of residents in affordable senior housing properties are eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and what that means is that Medicare is still the, pri is the primary payer for their health care needs, and then Medicaid would pick up any out-of-pocket costs they would have related to their Medicare services, and then if they use long-term services and supports, Medicaid would pay for those. And PACE um, is a program, um, it is a specific provider program that also serves, um, that serves more functionally and chronically disabled individuals. Um, right now it is for older adults, but there's consideration of it being expanded to serve younger adults as well. Um, and it is a, an all-inclusive program. So if you join PACE, um, 
you jo it's, it's actually a provider network and they provide all of your health and long-term services and support and have, a, have an ability, they receive a capitated payment, so have the ability to be very flexible in how they support their plan, their members. Um, so the way that these, these, this group of stakeholders is thinking about funding this, method, this um, initiative right now is that through a combination of um, two different layers. The first would be that the senior care options, the managed care plans, and the PACE members pay a per member per month fee of some sort for their specific members that are in the property um, to for that care, greater care coordination that the property would um, provide for them. And then they would provide a kind of a general flat fund fee of some sort to provide health and wellness programming for the whole community. And that would get pulled across the providers, providers and it would serve anybody in the community regardless of who their insurer was or their physician was. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this is an example about um, a community uh, program that was started through a commu hospital's community benefit program. This is Greater Baltimore Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland, and they um, have a program where they send a nurse practitioner to um, four senior housing properties and one housing day center. Um, the, nurse goes, the nurse practitioner goes out to each of these sites for one day per week, and that nurse, while she's on site, provides um, wellness checks, um, she answers health questions, she does medication reviews and reconciliations, and helps do a lot of care coordination um, for the residents, um, and then works very collaboratively with the service coordinators there. Um, and as I said, this is funded through the hospital's community benefit program. So several years ago, the hospital, um, in their community needs assessment, which all nonprofit hospitals are required to do every three years now, um, they identify one of the one of the key areas um, gaps that they identified in their in their service area was um, challenges that low-income older adults faced in accessing care. Um, so they responded by taking this care out to the communities where they could reach low-income older adults. Um, next slide, please. Um, and again, I just wanted to highlight some of the incentives that the Greater Baltimore Medical Center said they had to work in collaboration with the housing properties. Um, again, echoing what you had earlier, heard earlier from the Portland Initiative, they felt it provided them an opportunity to intervene um, with, with the low-income older adults before the health complications became crisis level so they could prevent, they could identify things early on and prevent them from um, blooming into a, an emergency room or a hospital visit. Um, it provided them the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with residents um, that they wouldn't necessarily do in a right, you know, in the hospital setting or even in the clinic setting. So it provided a different opportunity to work with res residents one-on-one, -on -one, specifically working through their, um, their, their often conglomeration of, of health and social service needs. Um, and also provided the, the, related to that, it provided the, the opportunity to do a lot of self-care management so that these residents could um, um, understand their health conditions and the best way to manage them better. So next slide, please. Um, and this is the final example I want to tell you about. And this one is a, a little bit different. This is a health um, and housing partnership that focuses more on the senior resident's functional health. So, you know, functional health challenges can, can ultimately um, lead to unwanted health service use and can really challenge a person's ability to live safely in their home and, and to age in place. So, um, so this is a partnership between legacy healthcare services um, and I'm highlighting here a particular housing proper, property in Denver, Colorado, Eaton Terrace. Um, but Legacy Healthcare works with other housing properties in Denver as well. And they are also located in other states um, besides Colorado. And my understanding is that they also work with housing properties there. So Legacy Healthcare Services um, is, a, is a, a rehabilitation provider, really. So they provide physical 
occupational and speech therapy. And in Eaton Terrace, they're also providing um, weekly, I believe twice weekly exercise classes. And so if a resident goes into the hospital, they can, and they need rehab after that stay, they can select um, Legacy Healthcare to be their rehab provider. Um, but the really um, great thing I think about this partnership, I think, is that the housing properties, if they notice residents that um, are having frequent falls or are having other functional challenges in moving around the building in their apartment and um, you know doing their daily living activities, they can refer this resident to um, to Legacy Healthcare, um, and then Legacy will work with their physician to order the healthcare services. Um, the housing property can't do that directly, but what they can really do is they can identify a pending need that may present um, more uh, crisis services. Um, and, and what's brilliant about this is these rehab services are provided on site, generally directly in the resident's apartment. Um, and that is really um, major benefit to everybody involved. So for, for legacy, it means their clients make their appointments because they don't have the challenges of getting out to a physical office. It also provides the opportunity for legacy to build relationships um, with the residents in the building, um, which is a marketing opportunity for them that in a, like these clients know them now and if they have the chance to choose a provider, they're gonna select legacy. And the real value for the residents is, again, the same thing. It's easy access for them to get to their appointments and not having to face the challenges of finding transportation and the challenges of, of moving around, particularly for people who have functional limitations. Um, so next slide, please. So I just want to close with telling you about one of our resources um, that might be helpful to you all. Um, we have created a housing and healthcare partnership toolkit. Um, and you can see the um, website at the bottom there. Um, and there's, there's several components to that toolkit. One is a, a guide with a lot of information um, to help facilitate um, collaborative efforts. And also in that toolkit are several videos um, and other, um, there's some return on investment calculators and some other resource documents all related to um, senior housing and health. Um, so that's, I guess I'll turn it back over to you now, Sarah. So thank you, Alicia. Um, we'll give folks a minute to come up with questions. One of the questions that we've gotten in so far really relates to the Olmstead Act, and I'm not the Olmstead Act, the Olmstead decision, and sort of, I think the question I'd ask you there is really around understanding what's been sort of the, you know, obviously the decision was was a while ago, but what's the ongoing sort of implications of Olmstead decision in thinking through and motivating or challenging this type of partnership? And just in case well, folks I are mean, not familiar with the Olmstead decision, maybe you should, maybe um, you're probably best positioned to explain what it is <laughs> rather than me. <laughs> sure. So the Olmstead decision essentially said that people need to be supported in the least restrictive environment that they are capable of living in. So it was really an effort to stop states from only building institutional services and institutional opportunities. Um, so I think that um, you know, partnerships like this really can help support and facilitate um, living up to the Olmstead goals. Uh, if you can provide these different, these health services in a more convenient and accessible way and a manner that's more appropriate for the, the older adults in these communities and younger persons with disabilities um, in these housing properties, um, you can help support their ability to live um, more safely and to live over a longer span in the community settings um, and, you know, potentially not move into a institutional setting simply because they can't get the good supports and resources that they need in the community. Um, and, you know, potentially you're also helping to prevent them from um, progressing in a functional decline that might also necessitate a higher level of care. 
Great. Well, Thank you thought, so you much. Know, that instead of maybe is to the state to help support or facilitate or encourage these kind of relationships, the healthcare providers themselves are not really subject to um, Olmstead requirements. Thank you so much for sharing all that work around senior health and having a new sort of opportunity, Sarah Alicia. And um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about sort of the supportive housing area and how that has connected and, and sort of integrated with health care systems. Um, this was as a result of our feedback from the first webinar we did on healthcare financing 101 and sort of how that's supporting partnerships and the basic underlying efforts there. We did mention supportive housing and there was a request for more on that. And so I'm gonna uh, pinch hit on that. Um, so here, if you don't mind moving on to, the, to this first slide. Um, like Alicia's presentation, it has a population focus, although it's always, of course, um, uh, place-based. So healthcare, um, I mean, one of the things that's come up and it came up particularly, I'm sorry, next slide, uh, came up particularly in the first webinar was really um, a new movement or an increased movement to understand who's using healthcare resources financing resources, services the most, and how can we target services to them in cost-effective ways that also improve outcomes um, to hit the triple aim of improving the availability of healthcare, reducing costs, and improving outcomes. Um, and, and, and the thing that's come up again and again is there's a certain number of individuals who are repeat utilizers of the of the emergency department. Um, some folks call them frequent flyers, some folks call them super utilizers. Uh, a term I heard recently that I love is calling them familiar faces. It seems a little friendlier. Um, but it, it, it is a reflection of the fact that repeat utilizers may have underlying issues that are better addressed through social determinants of health. In fact, as you explore that, a certain number are, ha are housing insecure or chronically homeless and or have a set of complex medical and health issues that are associated with housing and can be best addressed by combining housing and services and using a supportive housing, um, frequently a housing first mechanism to, to resolve those issues. And it's very appealing to the healthcare system because uh, it meets the, the, bo the bottom lines they care about, which are you know, financial, but also health outcomes. Um, so that's a, a, you know, a, a significant national sort of effort um, you know, Corporation for Supportive Housing and other organizations have, have been at the leadership of this. Uh, so I'm sort of standing in their place for the moment um, to share a little bit about how that's going. And I think what the interesting thing is that the financial sort of changes that underlie this, and because our webinar is focusing on financing, are really around switching from grant-based support for those services to um, expanded focus from Medicaid and managed care organizations, health plans like United, which came up earlier, and using supportive housing to reduce medical costs and improve health outcomes. The mechanisms are really varied. Um, it's not uncommon for them to be Medicaid waivers, uh, state plan amendments, sometimes abbreviated SPAs, if you've seen that abbreviation. There's a Medicaid rehab option. Health homes is something that was a function of the Affordable Care Act that has also uh, facilitated these in multiple states, and accountable care organizations have also been engaged in that. Um, uh, there will be no tests on this, but it's just to give folks a sense of what are the different, there's, that there's multiple different mechanisms, and sometimes it's a matter of figuring out which works best in which state, um, and there's, there's help and sort of technical assistance around sort of taking that next step uh, with certainly Corporation for Supportive Housing and others taking a leadership role in that area. Next slide. Um, so what I wanted to do is I always feel like things make most sense when you take a deep dive um, and let's go to Los Angeles, California, sunny California. Um, and this is, this is a great case study that was also done by the Corporation for Supportive Housing that walks through all the different ways in which um, what had to come together to make the death file project in Los Angeles, California um, happen from a services perspective, from a housing perspective, from a um, collaboration perspective. Uh, but some of the quick overviews are that it was targeting the top 10% of folks frequenting the emergency department. Um, they used a triage tool, which is developed by the Economic Roundtable, to identify folks who they um, who would be likely to be coming back to the emergency department. They had to be housing insecure or chronically homeless. Um, this collaboration has 25 different organizations involved: homeless services providers, affordable housing providers, but also um, healthcare centers, behavioral health centers. Um, hospitals. Hospitals, uh, probably a dozen hospitals engaged in this. 
Um, and it was Section 8 or um, Shelter Plus care vouchers and intensive case management, care coordination, and care integration um, beyond, uh, you know, maybe uh, the norm. Um, and the results were impressive. Um, you know, 54,000, uh, you know, averting 54,000 was the sort of the average per patient. Um, but there's also impressive results from the, the medical, from the health side. Um, you know, we're talking about hospital admissions down 84%, inpatient days down 80%. So again, the, the incentives for the healthcare system to engage in this are multiple and both in the cost and the outcome side of things. Okay, now, since this is a financing web, web, webinar, what were those funding sources? Um, and you can see, I'm not gonna walk through every, um, uh, every number on this PowerPoint and it will be sent out, but I think what's important to um, identify is that some of the support sort of to think about this and other projects that focus on um, folks who are familiar faces uh, comes from Social Innovation Fund, which was really designed to do a pay for success model and to invest the savings before, um, from the very beginning into housing. And that's one way to sort of redirect um, you know, to make sure that the savings go back to the underlying social determinant of health, that's important here. Um, and so that's one, the Conrad Hilton Foundation, Dignity Health, which Colby also mentioned, um, and Dignity Health has been a leader across the nation in, in many health and housing partnerships, um, and the Los Angeles County Care Health Plan. So those are sort of some of the things. Now, it's not just Los Angeles. Um, uh, here are a couple examples you'll see that are network network organizations. Um, one is Champlain Housing Trust, um, so that is a rural and small town example for folks who are asking about rural examples. Uh, there's three different models of hospital housing uh, investment where where the University of Vermont Medical Center has invested funds in three different strategies, um, which are all supportive housing, but with different sort of models depending on the specific needs. They started with placing four to five folks in a, in a supportive housing environment. I guess maybe you wouldn't say it's technically, it's not permanent supportive housing uh, because this might be folks who are coming out of the hospital um, and didn't have a place for a couple weeks, you know, so, so it's, it's not simply a permanent supportive housing model. Um, but that was the first step and they evaluated that and found $1.2 million savings to the healthcare system I'm doing that one from memory. I think that's right. Um, and that really led to a, a straight up housing first model in the Beacon Apartments and then Bel Air Apartments, which I think they're breaking ground on in June. Um, and again, that was uh, a co-investment model with the hospital investing, I believe, about a couple million dollars in capital as well. Um, I am talking quickly because we're almost out of time. Um, uh, there's some really neat things going on in Camden that have been led by um, Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers and St. Joseph has been uh, from a neighborhood network organization has been a leader in that, but you'll see a similar housing first collaboration. What I think is uh, exciting about it, well, many things exciting about it, but one thing is that it is from a accountable care organization perspective. That was something that came up in the first webinar as a model um, and that's sort of new from the Affordable Care Act that allows folks to take the incentives from um, and shared savings and, and really invest them where appropriate. So I'm really trying to wrap up because we only have two minutes left. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is um, just let you know, if you wanna know more about any of these, we'll send out resources. Uh, we did actually do an interesting um, webinar on Foundation Communities Supportive Housing Partnerships there. You'll see for that one, it was an 1115 Medicaid waiver. And if you're in the space of thinking about supportive housing and, and sort of paired uh, and co-invested strategies, uh, 1115 Medicaid waivers will come up a lot. It'll be your favorite number. Um, so while you're thinking of questions for me, Alicia, we can go back to Colby. Um, I do really want to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the County Health Rankings and Roadmap Program for generous support of some of the projects that we're doing um, and for also being an amazing set of resources. If you're interested in thinking about best practices, they are the What Works for Health database is my single favorite database. Oh, don't repeat that because there are many other favorites, I'm sure, but it really is awesome because it covers so many different things. Um, but in thinking about, you know, sort of best practices in this space, definitely check them out. Um, and I did want to really thank Thanks, Corporation for Supportive Housing, 
um, Foundation Community Champlain Housing Trust, St. Joe's, and PNDC for interviews, reports, data, and our photographs. Um, and we have one minute for one question. Oh, well, are there? It's always harder to handle questions when you're doing the um, um, the presentation. Okay, easy question. I like easy questions. Yes, the webinar is being recorded. We will share, we can share it with other folks. Um, a second question is low income housing tax credit investors are asking for 15 year commitments for services. Are you seeing providers willing to make a long term commitment like that? Or how are you navigating that issue? That's a fantastic question. Um, and I'm not sure who, oh, and we're two o'clock. So we can't quite take a stab at answering that because I do want to be really respectful of folks' time. Um, but one, we will be recording this um, and we will send out the webinar and we'll try to help uh, answer a lot of the questions that have come in. You may see them coming in and we'll respond to them in a written format. Um, and so thank you really to Colby and Alicia for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and your commitment to improving health equity. Everyone have a wonderful afternoon or if you're on the West Coast, have a great lunch. Um... Yeah. Oh, I'm you. You know what? Hey, what's going on? I'm sorry. We are still on. I just, yes, what's up? Hey, so it's Anne. So I was just, I was trying to message you guys to, you know, if you leave the, the chat open for a few minutes, um, you know, we can <clears throat> collect any additional questions and provide answers. Yeah, I thought that was a great idea, and I was trying to chat that know. back. Yeah. So, so where so would you if you leave this, yeah, good. If you leave it open for a few minutes, and if anybody else has any other questions, they can just drop them in the Q and A, and um, or in the chat box if they can't get into the Q and A. Okay. And I was about and to ask if you could or not. Um, because I'm trying to. I want to make sure I don't lose any of the questions or, or answers. So I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. Um, you know, I might just screenshot everything very quickly. I think there's actually a way to save a way to save chat. Why isn't there a way to save Q? Oh, I guess.
Hi everyone. Thank you so much for all of your questions. We're going to now, you know, we've saved all of the questions that everyone submitted, so thank you very much. We will follow up in the next couple of days with a follow-up email, including a link to the recording, links to resources, including the resources shared today in, the, in these presentations, and a copy of the questions asked and some of the answers, many of the answers. Thank you all so much, and now I'm going to close out the Zoom. Take care.